Final Exam, an Avatar The Last Airbender fan fiction. Chapter 17. Shiori stared at the tense, fire army issue, in bemusement. Yuyan trainees were never allowed such luxuries. She assumed that would be the way of things her entire term of service. Four tents that held two people apiece made up the encampment, but only one Yuyan, arm wrapped and held in place by a sling, greeted them. His headband was gray, marking him as an apprentice in his final year of training. Masters, I see your hunt was successful, although it appears you snagged an unanticipated prey. Success is the accomplishment of the assigned task. Anything less than that is a failure. Yes, Master Kozu. We would have had the Avatar if this brat had not interfered. The colonial jerked on Shuri's tether, forcing her to take a step forward in order to avoid being pulled off her feet. He snorted at the dirty look she shot him. Heh, glare all you want, little one. Before this day is through, that will most likely be the least of the indignities you'll suffer. Do not threaten her, Howley. It is not your place. Kozu untied the Water Tribe siblings from the out-of-place trainee and handed them over to his partner. Affix them to a tree somewhere, and make sure the girl is kept well away from water. Really? The blue-clad teens were led away, the gags muffling their protests. The taller archer turned back to the apprentice. Do you know her, Chun? She would have been a year behind you on Symmetra. The teen studied Shiori before shaking his head. No, which is odd. I thought I was familiar with most of the ones that passed the fourth year test. The wounded boy cocked his head to the side, and then his whole face brightened. That's right! I'd almost forgotten! I heard a third year passed her test with such high scores that Master Zoran allowed her to take the fourth year exam as well. I overheard Master Shio grumbling about it when I left. Her name was... Cecily or something. Shiori. Kozu focused his attention back on her. Your headband does not match your years. Master Zoran gave it to me when I left Symmetra. It was my reward for accepting this test. What kind of test? Shuri pressed her lips together. She knew she was in trouble, but did not feel like admitting her inadequacies out loud. Skipping a year is odd enough, but why would Master Zorin send her out into the world? I thought no trainee left the island without passing the final exam. <laughs> I suspect some high-ranking officer or Fire Nation noble is attempting to snag some Avatar glory for his own. Such activities are beneath the Yuyan. He gave Shuri a stern look as he spoke, and this time, she did avert her gaze. It wasn't her fault that she had gotten stuck between Prince Zuko and Admiral Zhao, per se, but now that she was face to face with the people she would hopefully one day serve with, she felt awfully guilty about scaring off the airbender. Kozu didn't question her further. He retied her ankles together and double-checked the bindings on her wrists. Then she was deposited next to the fire pit in the center of the camp, with the injured Chun as her guard. Her bow and quiver were put down a distance away, grouped together with the water tribe boy's elbow-shaped weapon and a club and the girl's water pouch. Kozu and Haoli were having a quiet conference on the far side of the camp. To her right, she could see the blue-clad siblings struggling against their bonds, Chun poked at the banked fire, stirring live embers up from the bottom of the ash-covered pit. The air was temperate. Although none of the moisture had been lost, it was beginning its shift from oppressively warm to damp chill that commanded the night. Did you really interfere with their capture of the Avatar? Why would you betray your own kind? Why is your arm broken? Couldn't you keep up? Shiori shot the boy a look that matched her thoughts, but he just stared back at her. She snorted and turned her head away, ignoring him. Disregarding his words, however, was far more difficult. Truly, if Master Zorin had wanted to test her resolve to follow orders without question, he would not have been able to come up with a better scenario than this. Her mandate from the Fire Nation Prince had been clear. The fact that it conflicted with the goals of her future brothers-in-arms was very unfortunate, but unavoidable. Still, guilt ate at her. It seemed crazy when one thought about it. All this detrimental competition to capture the Avatar when the future of the Fire Nation was at stake. Who cared who accomplished the feat so long as it was done? But she had to obey Prince Zuko's biddings in order to receive a favorable report and move on with her training, even if it meant making enemies amongst the Yuyan. It was the only way to prove that she was capable of being a weapon, one that did not hesitate or veer from its assigned target. Shuri's resolve to pass this test of her temperament had never been challenged to this degree. 
It was almost comical how many obstacles had been put in her path on this almost unknown land, and yet she would have to persevere. As Kozu had inadvertently reminded her, anything less than the successful accomplishment of her task was a failure, and Shiori could not fail. She comforted herself with the thought that nothing bad would happen to her brethren if they were unsuccessful here. The Yuyan as a unit were far too valuable to be degraded or punished, right? Of course, one of the reasons they were so valuable was because they never failed. Shiori stared at the newly roused fire, chewing on her lower lip. So consumed by her thoughts was she that she neglected to even look up when another archer jogged into camp. The new arrival went instantly to Kozu and Haoli, reporting loud enough in the prevailing silence over the whole camp to hear. The southern group received the return messenger, Hawk. The situation is unchanged. The Fire Nation soldiers on the island are not Admiral Zhao's men. We've been ordered to deal with them if they interfere. The words caught Shiori's attention and tugged her eyes upwards, and there they throws. She had not recognized the voice. Years ago, when last she heard it, it had possessed the high timber of youth. Now it was deeper, the voice of a man. But although his voice had changed, Keisuke's hair and eyes had not. He still looked like a firebender born, rich mahogany hair highlighted with red in the fading light of the sun, eyes, not the ambiguous ruddy color of her own, but truer, brighter. Her heart filled with excitement and love. Despite her bond, she sprang to her feet, shocking poor Chun, her supposed guard. But she gained her footing not to flee, no. That was now the furthest thing from her mind. Keisuke. Her face distorted into such a wide grin that she knew she looked like a fool. Then louder, she called his name. Keisuke! Too loud. It echoed in the forest, causing a flock of birds to take flight. All the eyes of the camp settled upon her. She took no notice. In that moment, her test, her concerns about Zuko and his men, her current predicament, none of that registered in her brain. She stood, shaking slightly. Her 14-year-old body, an inadequate vessel to contain her joy over seeing her long-absent brother once again. His eyes flickered over to her, his brows furrowed down. He was surprised to see her. Of course he would be. It's Shiori! She added that extra phrase just in case, just in case his memories of her had grown foggy with time. They had only laid eyes on each other once on Symmetra, after all, and at a distance at that. The frown did not go away, it deepened. Wordlessly, her brother turned around, muttering something softly to the other two. The group of the three moved a short distance away, where their words would not be so easily overheard. Shiori felt her enthusiastic smile begin to wilt around the edges. She stood, increasingly self-conscious about being the center of attention for all except the one she cared about. A flush rose in her cheeks. She shot a look she hoped was intimidating towards the Water Tribe team. The stupid peasants. It was none of their business anyways. Chun received a withering look of his own. He was wise enough, or foolish enough, considering that he was supposed to keep an eye on her, to find elsewhere to gaze. Shiori dropped back to the ground. Happiness and excitement were quickly replaced with anger. He was her only true family. How dare he ignore her? If she had been a firebender, Shiori was sure that the small campfire would have become a towering inferno as if it fed off her rage. Her anger was chased by a heavy dose of embarrassment, not only at her rejection, but at her personal actions. That was it, she realized. Keisuke was probably just embarrassed because she had made such a fuss. Of course, he wouldn't dignify her behavior with a response. He was a Yuyan. She was supposed to be well on her way to becoming one too, and the Yuyan definitely did not dissolve into shrieking fangirls just because something as minor as a family member walked into camp. Not even if it seemed like forever since last she had seen him. Not even if he was the reason for everything. Shiori closed her eyes reflecting back on some of the meditative exercises she had been taught. While she couldn't quite manage to summon the calm stillness that every true warrior possessed at their core, she did settle herself down somewhat. She mentally reminded herself that she was no longer Keisuke's little sister. She was Shiori, the fourth year student who trained at the fifth year level. She wanted nothing more than for her brother to be proud of her, so she had to act as if passing her test was the most important thing in the world. If she couldn't manage that, she'd never truly be reunited with him. As equals, 
No longer Keisuke's shadow. No longer someone to be left behind or ignored. She would be his equal. A smile flitted across her face as she remembered her true motivation for falling in her brother's footsteps. It would not do to fall apart now. To lose sight of her goal now that she was so close. Shiori, rise. She gazed up into the stoic face of her older brother, her rebellious heart, ignoring her will and her mind's directives, again surged with joy. This time, however, she kept the feeling locked inside, where it could not embarrass either one of them. She rose as smoothly as her bonds allowed. Leave us, Chun. The gray headband wearing trainee swiftly and wordlessly complied. You are here with the others, the Fire Nation soldiers who are not Admiral Zhao's men, correct? She saw no purpose in denying it. Yes. And the reason for being here is to capture the Avatar? Shuri did not respond. The answer seemed obvious. And you are being tested in some way. Do you serve the others? Yes. His eyes fixated on her red headband, a color only for fifth years. Thus far, his questions had lacked inflection. He could have been asking a perfect stranger directions for all his voice betrayed. But upon looking into his eyes, Shiori saw a flicker of something, some emotion that was hidden far better than she was capable of accomplishing. In that second, she felt a breath of fear kiss upon her spine. By all rights, we should kill you. All those who interfere with this mission are expendable. It is only because you are Yu Yan that mercy is being shown. The Avatar will be taken tomorrow. Attempt to intervene and your life will be forfeit. You should not have come, Shiori. You should not have followed. You are not meant to be Yu Yan. And with that, her brother, her family, stalked off. As twilight fell, she and the Water Tribe Sibs were concealed in one of the tents, bound together back to back and gagged. The boy struggled for quite a bit, irritating both girls. For her part, Shiori knew escape to be fruitless. There were quite simply too many Yuyan around, guarding the site in case of an avatar appearance. Come morning, they would take the Water Tribe siblings away, presumably unfettering only their legs and herding them to a location that favored archers over airbenders. There, they would stumble along, probably with their hands bound and mouths gagged, silently surrounded by Yuyan hunters awaiting the arrival of their prey. It would be simpler, Shodi thought, to exchange the freedom of his companions for the nomad himself. Perhaps she only thought that way because she had been traveling with Prince Zuko for so long. He had mentioned that the Avatar had almost instantly surrendered himself when the prince and his men threatened the Southern Water Tribe village. Perhaps true Yuyan, pure weapons as they were, did not think in plots and machinations. The girl winced, unwilling to let her mind travel too far down that path just yet. Unfortunately, much like a rhino, once given its head the thought refused to be reined in. Keisuke's hateful words echoed in her mind. She felt them like physical blows. They struck at her until she felt sick. Her heart hurt far more than her cheek and shoulder combined. It ached so much that she wished she could double over, curl up into a little ball, and sob. She had been too shocked before to properly react, stunned into silence by the foul judgment laid abruptly and unexpectedly upon her. Shuri had simply stared after her brother's retreating back. It had reminded her of the day he had left home to begin his journey on the Yuyan path. Now, as then, he never once looked back. It was nothing short of a miracle that she hadn't burst into tears right then and there. But she had been led into a tent with the blue clad prisoners and secured to them. The Yuyan hunters had the information they wanted. She was no longer necessary, and Shiori had refused to give in to her tears in front of the other two. Now, however, as time passed and darkness fell outside, she was losing her fight to hold them back. Hot and bitter, they spilled from her eyes. Oh, how she hated her weakness. Stupid Casegate! Stupid Casegate! She thought the words over and over. She shouted them in her head in an attempt to drown out his evil judgment against her. But it was his voice that prevailed, whispering softly, steadily in the background. Why? Why did everyone assume she was unfit for duty? She had been the very best of her third year class. So high were her scores that she had been permitted to take the fourth year test, which she had also passed. 
What more did they want from her? What more could she do to prove herself? A thought struck her. Maybe Keisuke, like Prince Zuko, believed that she had followed only in order to usurp his glory. If that was the case, she needed only to explain to him the truth. That was her love and admiration for him that had set her on this path. But what would mere words accomplish? Actions spoke louder than words, and her behavior thus far had earned Shiori her brother's scorn. The only way was to pass this test. That would silence her detractors permanently. It was the only way. Her doubts, her guilt over fighting her future comrades, vanished. Keisuke had motivated her as only an older brother could. She'd show him. She'd pass this test in the final exam too. She'd watch as he was forced to eat his hateful words, and she'd wait until he apologized to her before explaining her motives for following in his footsteps. Suddenly, Shorty was glad that they were choosing to hunt the air nomad rather than trade for him. Hunting would take more time, which only benefited her cause. Shiori knew that she would be left in the care of the injured Chun. While escaping from a camp of Yuyon was impossible, escaping from a one-armed team who was scarcely older than she should hardly prove an unsurmountable challenge. Final exam was written by Magnus Ray. Avatar The Last Airbender is owned by Nickelodeon, Michael Dante DiMartino, and Brian Konietzko. The narrator for this story is Makia Royer. The voice of Chun is Timothy Durambas. The voice of Kozu is Gendi Oda Cog. The voice of Hao Lee is Alexander Johnson. The voice of Shiori is Lexi Orda. The voice of Keisuke is Hylian Knight 97. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week. Walk a lonely road, the only one that I have ever known. Don't know where it goes, but it's home to me, and I walk alone. I walk this empty street on the boulevard of broken dreams where the city sleeps and I'm the only one and I walk alone. Mm -hmm. I walk alone, I walk alone. Mm -hmm. I walk alone, I walk alone. My shadow's the only one that walks beside me. My shallow heart's the only thing that's beating. Sometimes I wish someone out there will find me. Till then I walk alone.